brought a lot of flames. I was wondering why that was under there. <laughs> this is the stand. Is that like one of the robots in your earlier one? Fortunately not, no. need to hear it, so. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and to Joe for the, the kind introduction this, mor this morning. Yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely delighted to have been invited to, to talk at the McGill Summer School that I grew up with, so it's a fantastic opportunity to get home as well, not on a holiday but on a, a work visit. So, um, so in today's uh, connected age, it's possible for someone to open your front door using an interactive doll. So you may wonder how this is possible. So meet Kayla. Kayla is an interactive doll uh, with internet connectivity. So she can answer questions and she can also read stories to your child via an app on a tablet. So let me demonstrate. So two years ago, um, there was a number of vulnerabilities discovered with the doll. And so last summer, I asked one of my intern students to see if for their project, could they try and hack uh, Kayla. So sent him off to do the task, thinking it would take him all summer. He came back in just five minutes. He goes, yeah, it's done. <laughs> So that was great, but it also meant that I had to come up with a whole new project for him over the summer. So let me show you how this works. This is a fun story. Let me start. Hello, my name is Kayla, and I have been hacked by Adam Galway, an intern at the Centre for Secure Information Technologies. As a doll, I am not very smart. All I can do is listen to what you say and play sounds. I had no built-in security features at all. And Kayla has actually been banned in Germany um, due to the very strict privacy laws and because of obviously the very easy way that the doll could be hacked and say anything to your child, they have completely banned it. Now, Kayla is also capable of recording audio and replaying it. So it was demonstrated that she could be hacked into to issue the required voice activation to open a smart lock. And unfortunately, there are many interactive devices with internet connectivity like Kayla that do not consider security or it is just an afterthought. So the Internet of Things or IoT this really encompasses all devices that, are, that can be connected to the internet or are capable of connecting to each other. So this includes everyday objects like uh, your, your fridge, your washing machine, watches, your TV. And with internet connectivity, these are typically referred to as smart devices. So a smart TV, a smart watch, a smart fridge, and so on. 
So it's forecast that by next year, there will be four connected devices per person in the world, and that uh, there will be nine connected devices per person by 2025. Now, last year, Tech Republic, a website for IT professionals, released a list of the 11 least secure connected devices. Now, not surprisingly, this included devices like interactive toys, uh, smart locks, connected cars, wireless medical devices, um, overlooked office devices like connected coffee pots. I'm not sure why you need a connected coffee pot, but um, wireless routers and smart, uh, smart baby monitors. But what you have to remember is that if an attacker can compromise any of these devices and they can gain then internal access to your network, then all of your information is at risk. And what we're starting to see is a significant increase in the number of attacks against these types of Internet of Things devices. So in October of 2016, the Murai botnet, uh, this attack, compromised over 100,000 IoT devices. And this was for use in what was called a massive distributed denial of service attack against an internet service provider in the US. But basically, it brought down a whole range of internet sites, including Netflix, Amazon, Twitter, and news websites like CNN and Fox. Now, this map here depicts the global state of Mirai infected devices back in 2016. And what you can see from it that this truly is a global problem. And now, since 2016, there have been many variants of this type of attack. Um, just at the end of last year, a much more sophisticated attack emerged called the Tauri botnet. And this targeted even a wider range of IoT devices over the, 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 um, the Murai botnet shown here. And rather than being used in a distributed denial of service attack, this botnet was actually capable of extracting sensitive information from devices and running commands on the infected devices. Now, very interestingly, last year during the Trump-Putin summit that was held in Finland in July, there was a significant spike in attacks of IoT devices during the summit dates. So the devices targeted were those that could yield audio or visual information so likely in an attempt to gather information and intel on the two world leaders and staff. Now, a common theme with all these device uh, attacks and the botnets is that they often use weak or default credentials to access the target devices. Now, counter counterfeit devices um, are also on the rise. So with the growing numbers of connected devices that we're seeing, uh, with 20 billion uh, predicted by in the next five years, are we actually heading towards an internet of cloned things? So with the globalization of the supply chains, the design and manufacture of today's electronic devices is now distributed worldwide. We have the use of overseas silicon chip foundries, the use of third-party intellectual property and third-party testing facilities. So now with so many different untrusted entities uh, involved in the design and assembly phases of our electronic devices, it is becoming increasingly difficult to ensure the integrity and the authenticity of those devices. So the supply chain is now viewed as being susceptible to a range of threats. So including the malicious modification of the electronic circuits, so this is known as hardware trojans, uh, intellectual property piracy, reverse engineering and cloning. So I guess for the future potential of internet connected devices to be realized, security must be a priority in IoT devices. And where possible, it must be built into the devices from the outset of their design. It must be prioritized right across the value chain, from the manufacturers to the IoT service providers through to the retailers and even us as consumers. So what can we do? Well, at the end of last year, in the UK, their National Cyber Security Centre published a code of practice for consumer IoT devices. And this year, in February of this year, new European standards were published for IoT device manufacturers. And both of these require the manufacturers to ensure that security is considered in the design of all new 
internet-connected devices. So at Queen's University Belfast, I lead the Centre for Secure Information Technologies, or CSIT. And uh, my team and I are investigating lightweight designs that can be used to authenticate IoT devices. And we are using technology that's known as physical and clonable functions, or PUF technology. So I guess, uh, what is a PUF? I want to explain that to you. So this is the only science part of the, of the presentation. So this is really, PUF technology is effectively a digital circuit that can distinguish between inconsistencies in a chip that occur during fabrication. And we can use these to generate a unique identifier for every chip. So similar to having a digital fingerprint for devices. So for example, this means that this technology could be used to verify the authenticity of IoT devices. So if a device was cloned, then the identity of the cloned device would actually differ from that of your genuine device. And it could also be used to provide secure access control devices and to detect whether devices have actually been tampered with in any way or not. So we developed a very lightweight puff design, specifically for hardware devices, and it offers high uniqueness and reliability across a wide range of devices. And the technology has been built into a demonstrator for electronic component counterfeiting in industry. Now we're also investigating the, how to detect uh, the malicious modification of all of electronic circuits, so hardware trojans and circuits. And this is actually a very complex problem, and actually we're using some of the advanced techniques involving machine learning to help sort of solve these complex problems and actually help, help to accelerate the detection of any malicious activity that's happening on electronic chips. And that's current work that we're looking at. So I guess um, what I'd like to finish with is some tips as to what you can do. Um, if you're buying any device that connects to the internet or is capable of connecting to other devices. So I'd like to leave you with, I guess, four tips um, for buying internet connected devices. The first of these is around default passwords and pins. So many IoT devices currently being sold use default usernames, passwords and pins that are incredibly simple. Admin 00001234. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a very common way that hackers use to gain access to devices. So when you buy a device, simply change the default password. Now the good news is that in the future with the new European standards that are coming in, manufacturers are required to no longer ship devices with default passwords. So in the future, we should hopefully see all devices being actually sold with unique passwords. So until then, change your default password. The second is to try and keep software updated on devices. So manufacturers will typically release software updates to protect devices against potential vulnerabilities. So if it's possible, when you buy a new device, there may be an option on that device to automatically update uh, software on the device. Ensure that is enabled, because then that will ensure that the device will automatically have the latest software from the manufacturers to help protect against vulnerabilities. The third tip is just to consider placing IoT devices on a separate network. So if um, a device is compromised, if any of these sort of smart devices are compromised, it means that the attacker can't then gain access to your home computers or shared files that you might have or mobile information on mobile phones that are also connected to that same network. And these typically will contain much more sensitive and private information than, say, uh, an interactive doll that's connected to the same network. So what you can do is, if you're getting something installed in your home, you can check to see if your, your Wi-Fi router typically has what's called guest networking options available. And that guest networking allows you to connect any new devices coming into that network without providing them access to any shared file or other network devices. So it's a really useful thing to consider with new devices. And then finally, only buy devices that have built-in security features. Check for user reviews before you buy devices to see if, if there are any known vulnerabilities. So in the UK, the government is currently considering plans to label internet-connected devices with information about how resilient they are to cyber attacks. So similar to your food uh, food quality labeling that you have on restaurants, wouldn't it be great if we have devices that actually tell you the level of security that's available to them? 
So what I would say and finish with, if an IoT device that you're buying hasn't considered security in any way, don't buy it. Thank you very much.